worked with, and in the first year we had 157 applicants. Again, these are adolescent males. And the first thing that we did was that we gave them educational testing. And we found that 78% of the applicants had a very basic level of proficiency in math and English, which means their grade level was between zero to six. So again, these were adolescent males, 16 to 20 years old, some of whom either completed high school or secondary school, but had anywhere between zero to six grade level with numeracy and literacy. We further found that 50% of those, those 157 applicants, at the very basic level, scored within the lowest range measured on the test. So basically, they were illiterate or very barely literate after going through the secondary school system. But we also found, and we've been talking a lot about that today, the idea of traumatogenic environments. And Lynn Layton, who is a psychoanalyst with social leanings, describes traumatogenic environments as individual and group physical, safety, social security, and symbolic capacities are all simultaneously assaulted. And this is what we found as we got to know the boys. Uh, much better. There's quite a bit of community violence. That's no surprise. We know the murder rates in Jamaica. Um, extensive parental neglect and abuse, uh, generations of trauma. Um, so for example, I would, I remember one youth in particular that come, came up for me as I was putting this presentation together. Um, very disruptive behavior in the classroom. And so we started to engage the mother who came in to see me. Um, as I wanted to talk to her about her son. The mother started telling me about her disciplinary measures, um, some of which were to call her son um, fish, b-boy, all of these things in the hopes that this sort of harsh discipline would get him to act like a man, to stand up strong, but she was doing it through degradation and shaming. But as she started to talk about her history, she just started crying with me. And here was a woman who had a history of multiple sexual assaults, um, living in violent communities. So as we see, there were generations of trauma where often I would start to work with um, the students, but then end up doing quite a bit of work with the parents, which I'm sure um, other presenters know very well that context. Um, poverty, um, we, that's no surprise to us. Sudden and traumatic loss and grief, this was palpable um, with the boys that we served. Many of them had family members um, dying from violence, friends dying from violence, um, family members dying very um, suddenly, if you want to call it, from ill health, not being able to afford appropriate health care. And something else that is really very important is poor access to services. Um, a few of our boys, for example, didn't have birth certificates. And so a lot of our work was case management, trying to um, navigate the system to help our boys come up with birth certificates. So you would have very talented boys, for example, in football or art who couldn't really go very far with it because of some of these structural inequities. All right, so um, it sets the stage for social and emotional problems. So um, one of the tools that I used um, frequently was the ACEBO. Um, so it is a scale that measures um, social and emotional um, behavioral problems, internalizing and externalizing problems. And I just brought up a, a few scales um, from that, of course, without any names and so on. So we found, for example, so for those who are not familiar with a scale, whenever you see the line graph going above those dotted lines or within it, it means it's in clinical or subclinical range. And ACEBA is one of the tools that's actually normed on a Jamaican population, which is why we used it. it has Jamaican norms, I should say, not that it is normed, but it has Jamaican norms. And so, for example, we saw youth with aggressive behavior and social and thought problems, depressed youth with frequent somatic complaints. Um, any of you who work in the educational system, I'm sure work with adolescents who often put their heads on the desks, often complain of headaches, needing to go to the bathroom, all of this stuff. So depressed youth with frequent somatic complaints and rule-breaking behavior, for us it was most often substance misuse. 
and youth with a gamut. As you can, as you can see from um, this one, almost everything is in clinical range here. So for a psychologist to look at, this is quite disturbing, but it's a regular occurrence. So youth with a gamut of internalizing and externalizing problems. So now, Freddie Hickling in 2016, as I was going through his book, I took out a quote that I just thought summed up the experience. And it is that the entire society, the Jamaican society, has been plunged into a miasma of problems that can only be likened onto a descent into madness. So here we were at the school grappling with these um, issues that came in to, to us. And one of our goals, um, and I'm quoting Ferry here because it kind of summed it up also very nicely, was that we wanted to know how to convert the rebellious attitudes that we were seeing into revolutionary ones. So we've, we've you know, on the surface, we very much felt that these were adolescent youth with quite a bit of potential, that if harnessed appropriately, they could become citizens of Jamaica who could contribute to change. Okay. And so um, what were some of our interventions? We looked at educational interventions, so the school on a whole, and then I'll go more into some of um, our interventions in the counseling department. Um, skills training, um, so vocational skills training in a few areas. Engaging the youth in sports, something that they were naturally very good at, football being one of them, um, very popular. Um, civics, it was very important to us that youth started talking about some of the things in Jamaica, the history how Jamaica runs, religious education, not as a form of indoctrination, but more or less understanding how religion affects people and their worldviews. Um, and the youth were put in internships in their second year, um, starting in the second year of the program where they had work experience and exposing the youth to areas outside of the inner city, taking them on trips. For us in the counseling department, we tried a gamut of interventions from individual and group counseling, parental meetings, testing, social work, and social welfare. Quite a few of our boys um, spoke to our case manager who had a strong um, background in social work, and they would get free meals, for example, or help with bus fare. Their parents would be um, um, talked to and integrated in the system, and we, saw, we tried to see how we could help the parents. Home visits was also very important, and life skills classes. At the time, I was um, becoming very involved in the Dream World Cultural Therapy Program, so it was very important for me to incorporate some of those concepts into the life skills classes, um, teacher staff training, and consultations to administrators. No. All of this looks wonderful. I must say that um, we were resource limited. And so um, in the counseling department, there was myself, uh, the case manager, and a volunteer guidance counselor. After about a year, we got um, interns. And in the third year, we had two graduate level interns. So um, working with 150 boys who come in with the miasma of problems, to have that amount of staff is very limiting. So we couldn't quite adequately carry out all that we wanted to carry out. But in the context of all of this, what were some of, uh, what were some of the feedback that we got? So looking through some of the reports and emails sent to me, um, clinicians sometimes would come in to run workshops and deliver reports. I extracted a few quotes. The experience at this school was remarkable, um, and it was an educating experience. Somebody said, um, one clinician said to me after speaking with the boys, they said that this is the best they've ever had it in a school environment, and one person described it as an oasis. Okay, so the next slide is going to be very interesting to you after I, I gave all of this. I started to review the program. And in year two, this isn't a year one review, I found out that we had up to an 80% dropout rate. So we had an 80% dropout rate from year one to year two. And the dropout rate was due either to uh, students dropping out. Sometimes students would come to me and say they can't maintain two years because of the poverty that they lived in and they wanted a job. No, 
right? And so they couldn't sustain the vision of what might come at the end of two years. Um, unfortunately, we relied heavily, I think, too heavily on suspensions and expulsions, and I'm going to talk about that. And so some of our students were suspended and just never came back because they needed to bring in family uh, to talk to parents and um, principals, and some of them did not either have family or they weren't interested in bringing their family in. Um, and some just never showed up in year two. They just never showed up. So despite all of these um, interventions that we wanted to put into place, this was the result initially. No, it's, it was a new program, so I'll reflect on that too. So what do I think was happening? This is actually a young Caribbean scholar, um, Hakeem Williams, and he wrote about his experience in Trinidad, which I think is very much uh, similar to my experience in this um, vocational problem. And he called it a colonial warp, that there are strong forces that despite our best intention will pull us back to the status quo. And for us, the status quo is a colonial mentality. It just is. And so we look at hierarchies. We were very dependent on um, ministries that didn't adequately fund us. And we had to navigate bureaucracy that was often a pain in the you know where. And so um, also despite um, sometimes teachers' best interests and desire to help our students to become revolutionaries, it was very easy in the face of some of the hostility that can come with attachment problems, hostility that can come with trauma, the disorganization. It is very, very easy to fall back into a hierarchical structure. Instead of sort of maintaining or sitting with some of that chaos, what you tend to do is say, OK, you do this. No, if you don't do this, you'll get punished, despite um, your best interests. Um, also, curricula is one of the uh, issues within a colonial warp. Um, we did not get a curriculum for the first two years of the program. There was no curriculum coming forth from the ministry for us. No, I think somebody like Freddie Hickling would say, well, that's actually a good thing. But when you're starting, because you have a lot of freedom to explore and to tap into cultural DNA to teach, but again, when you're beginning, it's often uh, very easy to fall back into traditional modes of thinking. And disciplinary technologies. Again, um, we have a tendency in Jamaica, which was no different in this school, despite our best efforts, again, our best intentions, I should say, to fall back on harsh discipline. So that was seen in the classroom, where the teachers frustrated, overwhelmed, under-resourced, fell very easily on suspensions. And it was also, again, seen in the families. So um, one thing I vividly remember was a young man who, for all intents and purposes, was very depressed. Okay, 